Okay, all right. So um, it's great to be here, and I'm going to be talking about work which is really the uh, PhD work of Vanessa Echeverria. She's just writing up her PhD right now, um, and co supervised by myself and Roberto Martinez Maldonado, who is some of you will know anyway, is there's a long track record here, did his PhD with Judy, and now joined my group down the road. Um, and our interest is in how we can use the new kinds of sensor infrastructures that are becoming possible to close the feedback loops to learners. Okay. And um, you know, so I'm very involved in the field of learning analytics, um, but often that talks about giving feedback to learners based on data gathered online. But we're in this work looking at, well, the fact that online no longer, of course, means hands on a keyboard using some online platform. I could be online now. So as this, you know, as rooms become capable of sensing what's going on inside them, we can suddenly start doing learning analytics and feed, closing feedback loops for co-located face-to-face activity. Right. And then we're not talking about mining the clicks that are going through the platform. We're talking about mining multimodal data streams. Okay. And so I'll be giving you a, an applied example. What we do in KIC is work closely with faculties around the university to develop uh, what we hope will become business as usual. So we're, we don't, we're not just a, a research group trying to prove a new concept, write the paper, you know, get the grant. Um, we're actually trying to build the next generation of teaching infrastructure for the university. Um, and uh, so we have an applied example today from the world of nursing. But of course, as researchers, we're thinking about, well, what, what methodology are we going through here? Uh, because we've got a generic challenge here that we've got multiple streams of data coming in from an activity, and we need to make sense of that, and we want to feed that back to the participants in a way that's meaningful. So what does it mean to go from low-level data to meaningful feedback? That's the, high, that's the sort of the feedback design challenge. Okay. Uh, this is actually based on the Kai paper that I gave a couple of weeks ago at Kai, uh, but I'm giving you an extended version because I only had 15 minutes there. Uh, so um, I've put a few more materials into this. Okay, um, so maybe I will stand up because uh, otherwise I can't see the slide very easily. Um, this is our context. So down the road we have simulation wards where we have students engaged in quite high stress simulations. Okay? Uh, you might have up to six teams on a ward. Um, you've got three beds here and there's three beds around the corner on the other side. And there's one instructor coaching and, and tracking how they're going. Um, okay? And you know the mannequin patient can uh, lose consciousness or be sent into cardiac arrest or provoked into all sorts of states. And the students, of course, are meant to leap into action and do the right thing. But if they make a mistake, at least they're not going to kill anybody. All right. Now, the question is, how could we make sense of what's going on around one of those beds and give that team feedback from, based on what they actually did? Okay. And the problem is that this is kind of analytically cloaked in the sense that it's an expression we use when there seems to be no data available in this situation for a computer to make any sense of. Okay. The only thing that's recording that are some video cameras up in the roof. Okay. But they have a very brief debrief afterwards. There's no time to retrieve the video, replay the video. They don't really use the video data very much. Okay. So the challenge is how can we make the debriefs that happen after this kind of simulation much more effective. Okay. And we know they could be improved because we've been using participatory design techniques to elicit from the instructors and from the students what their experience is of these simulations. Right? And we would use, you know, uh, we've written a paper, it was presented at OSCI uh, last year, and we were using techniques like asking educators, you know, what if you had superpowers, you know, what would those superpowers be? that would allow you to give better feedback. Or asking the students, you know, sketch for us, 
you know, what you do when, and there's, there's the simulation ward, and those are the debriefing tables, and they, they were using just, you know, pens and papers and small icons to talk to us about what we called learner data journeys. And we were asking them, when do you think you could get better feedback if we could collect data? Okay. And, you know, we have lots of examples of this, you know, students saying the tutors have got, you know, such a big class, they can't supervise everybody all the time, you know, how could they possibly give feedback to every student on how they've done, right? Six teams of four or five students. Um, or, you know, time's against us, we don't have enough time. Um, uh, you get many different feelings coming back at you. It is, it can be an emotional experience, okay? Um, I think that a better feedback would give me perspective, because when you're in the simulation, you can't see where you're positioned, you can't see how you're talking. They're so in it that they can't step back and reflect on it. Instructors, you know, again, lots of useful information from them. You know, could we capture the students' body positions or their movements and then help them visualize the whole activity and how they, how they performed the whole activity, the whole task? You know, and, and, and they were basically saying, well, if only I could be omniscient and see what every team was doing in super high detail and had a perfect memory and could go through every simulation with every student, you know. There's my fantasy. So that's giving us clues as to what the role for technology might be. So we, we started thinking about how we could give feedback. And then we, we drew inspiration from this work by Tom Erickson from IBM back at, 10 years ago now, who talked about social translucence. Now, they were worrying about online platforms and the fact that when you go online, you lose all this peripheral awareness of what's going on compared to when you're in a physical setting. Right? You walk into a, a conference or a party or a small group, there are all sorts of cues about what's going on and those are missing when you go online. And so they talked about social translucence and they talked about translucence in the sense that you know, a sort of frosted glass door or a glass window gives you a sense of what's on the other side to judge whether you know, there's a meeting going on or not, whether there's somebody on the other side of the door about to come through that way. Um, but it's hiding data as well. So it's the notion of revealing appropriate levels of data and information to other people. Uh, so everybody knows what's being disclosed, but it's kind of privacy respecting as well. Okay. So we thought, okay, well, that's interesting. Um, and they, they came up with some interesting sort of visual widgets. They called them social proxies. Okay, so here's a social proxy for group chat in a system they created. So. When people are chatting in the chat room, their, their circles move to the center and it's like they're gathered around a table talking. And then when, when they finish talking, then their icon moves back out to the side. Okay. So just as, at a glance, you can tell you know, what's going on. Here's perhaps a more familiar sort of view. Here's a, a timeline of who was online when and when were they chatting, again marked by those little marks. Here's a slightly different one. It's an online lecture. The online lecture, this is what we normally expect to see. Speaker and people paying attention, right? But if somebody starts talking, then their icon moves forward. And if everybody starts talking, well, the whole lecture norm has broken down at that point, okay? So a nice little visual that gives you a sense of what happened um, without, you know, being a full-blown video replay where you could see exactly who was doing what, etc. Okay, so. Given that we know that these can be you know, emotionally and cognitively intense, people cannot remember everything that happened, there's no way that the poor instructor can, can see what's going on all the time, could we create visual proxies for this co-located collaboration rather than online? Okay. So we've got an analytics challenge. First of all, we've got to sense the world. And then later on, of course, we're going to talk about how we're going to make sense of that data and how are we going to make it visible in a, fa in, a, in a form that makes sense. Different kinds of sensors. All the people are wearing our sort of smart badge thing and the space is instrumented. There's a microphone array in this setup detecting you know, who is talking more in different directions. We've got the mannequin that's streaming data itself. The mannequin, depending on the model, can know when its you know, heart rate goes up and down, when it's being given treatment, when a measurement is taken off it. Uh, and they're wearing wristbands as well, picking up um, skin conductance and um, acceleration. Uh, so that was actually a, a single bed simulation room 
and then this was a slightly different setup in the in the multi bed ward where we had lapel mics on them um, and similar equipment in elsewhere. Uh, now I'm not a hardware specialist, that's what Roberto and Vanessa do, so don't ask me very detailed questions about the hardware, etc. But you know, we can certainly answer any questions you have um, if you follow up. Okay, now one of the challenges of this is figuring out how we're going to model this whole setup. And one of the things we wanted to talk about was we didn't want to just record XY position of where somebody was in the room because it became quite clear talking to the stakeholders, the teachers and the students, that location has meaning. And there are some particular zones that have particular meanings, right? Being next to the patient or being over the patient or being at the top of the bed, very important for somebody in a particular role to be at the top of the bed when they're doing a certain kind of procedure, okay? And then there's being around the patient and then there's retrieving equipment from the trolley, okay? So we can make sense of five zones and that's done simply by talking to the stakeholders and understanding what makes this space actually meaningful for the kinds of activities we're talking about, all right? And if, if we're in this space doing some completely different procedure, maybe the zones will be different as well, okay? So it's, it's highly contingent on, on this activity. And then we use the ACAD framework, which was developed here by Peter Goodyear and his team, presented at CHI a few years ago that said, well, if we want to study activity-centered uh, uh, design, then we need to talk about a bunch of things. The set, you know, borrowing a sort of theatrical metaphor. How is the stage set with physical devices, etc.? cetera? Um, what are people actually doing? The epistemic tasks, the tasks that they have to do. Um, the social dynamics and the ways that people can configure themselves to perform the task. And then we added another dimension, not in the ACAD framework, which is to do with affect and emotion and feelings, because we know from you know, all the literature how important that is in healthcare uh, and how students learn to cope with that dimension of things. And a bit of background is, is, is the task that we have, which is a generic challenge facing learning analytics uh, as a field, is to move from talking about these kinds of things, which is what educators talk about, like a learning outcome or a student competency, right? And we might break those down. And these are things that, they're, they're, they're constructs, you know, the ability to work in a patient-centered way, the ability to, to solve problems in, in a suitable time frame, right? But we can only assess those when they become observable. So we have to invent we have to figure out how are we going to assess this, right? And if we're going to introduce computers, then of course we want to be able to map what's computationally detectable back up the chain. So if we can if we can create this form, you know, principled mapping from what can be seen by a machine back up the chain, we could say, well, this combination of digital traces we will treat as a proxy for this subconstruct of this overall outcome, okay? So there's lots of people now in the learning analytics field talking about how one does this and what this looks like in different contexts. And um, this is actually a figure from uh, a handbook chapter we've just written for the International CSCL Handbook, which says, well, CSCL's traditionally been very strong on the left-hand side. Learning analytics is very strong on the right-hand side, uh, but gets a lot of criticism from some people that it's kind of atheoretical and it's disconnected from learning science, right? Whereas CSCL has a little bit of reserve about trying to quantify too many of these things, but they're very happy talking about these things, you know, and having manual analysis of the data gathered. So we're trying to bring the two together here. And we can go a little bit further and say, well, you've got your construct here and you've got your digitally captured event here, but, you know, when you've got advanced analytics techniques, they derive higher order features from the lower level features, and that might happen many times. You might get more and more derived features, and you might then set metrics that say, well, if we exceed this threshold, we will then count that as a significant you know, proxy for this construct. Okay. And in, in the chapter that we wrote, we, we gave a few examples you know, where this team wanted to talk about the cognitive presence of students in an online discussion. 
And so the source data is what was posted online. But then they are deriving features from natural language processing, which allow them to define you know, a statistical measure of what they call comparative prevalence, whatever that might mean. right? But they treated that as a computational proxy for this theoretical construct. Right? Or here, Dan Southers wanted to know, to what extent are students uptaking ideas from each other in an online conversation? So again, we start with the forum postings and the log file data. He then derives sort of semantic and temporal features from there, and then defines a bunch of metrics. Similarly here, the authors are interested in this idea of who's posting promising ideas online? What is, what's a promising idea? Okay, well, we can con we, we're basically, we've got to quantify that, right? We start with the postings, they extract terminology and, and, and so forth. They, they, they have a, a way of modeling the connections between discourse units, which are the contributions to the platform. And then they derive measures of semantic similarity and change between the students' postings. Okay? So this is how you go from something that has you know, educational research credibility as a significant construct worth assessing down to the actual stuff that machines are logging. Okay? So this is what we have to do now for our nurses. Curriculum outcomes in UTS Bachelor of Nursing, right? Patient-centered care and teamwork, okay? What do they mean? Well, we're gonna use the ACAD framework to deconstruct the key four dimensions that we're interested in of those. And we're gonna refine those into sub-constructs that you can see there. And then finally, we're going to map the data sources that we can actually pick up. All right. OK. That is going to create a data matrix of classes of data in the columns. OK. Physical, epistemic, social, and effective. That's, that's our model of what we're interested in in co-located activity. That could be any framework or theory you choose that you want, right? And then we're going to start populating it with rows of data bounded by time. And that time is whatever seems like a sensible unit of time for the kind of activity you want to study. Could be microseconds, could be every 60 seconds. Who knows? It depends on what you're interested in. And then we have data coming in in the physical, you know, the RN1. RN1 is a registered nurse. RN1 was next to the patient or over the patient, and what was their level of intensity of activity, what were they doing in terms of the actual task, checking the pulse, CPR, what were they doing in the social dimension, was the nurse talking or was the patient talking, what was happening on the affective dimension coming off the wristbands. Okay. So we then have the ability to create stanzas which uh, are meaningful chunks of time. For example, this simulation had two phases, before and after the patient went into a critical state of some sort. Okay. We're very interested, based on what the educators are telling us, they want to know what changed when that patient went critical. Okay. So we need to be able to talk about those things in our data. And then, of course, you start populating the data matrix. Okay. Was the, where was RN1, 01, 02, 03 seconds, right, next to the patient? Low physical activity check the pulse in that time band, et cetera. Okay? So that's the schematic of what we're doing. A couple of points to add to that. We are make, so basically, we are making modeling decisions here. Okay? We are deciding how to convert the low-level data into higher-order constructs. That's a modeling task. And these, um, these, these data rows, they could be added completely automatically if we had a completely automated infrastructure. We do partially, I'll say more on that later. Or, you know, you could download the data, a postdoc or PhD could go off and analyze it for three weeks, and then add more data to the, to the matrix in good old fashioned qualitative data analysis style. Okay. So this representation is meant to integrate machine and human analysis, and it's meant to integrate quantitative data with enriched insights from very qualitative conversations with the stakeholders. Okay. 
And that is an example of what David Williamson Schaefer is calling quantitative ethnography. He is on a mission to harmonize quantitative and qualitative methods for analyzing large data sets. If you haven't read the book, it's well worth it. Um, definitely worth watching his keynote address at the Learning Analytics Conference last year. I'll give you all these slides after so you can chase these down. Um, and he talks about the fact that you know we need to sort of he wants to end the qual quant war, right? Which exists between many disciplines, right? Who have you've got qualitative people who are deeply suspicious of people who are using statistics, and you've got statistical people who poo-poo qualitative analysis because they never analyze stuff at scale, and you know who knows how how representative their samples are when they give you five quotes, you know? Right? He's trying to bring them together, and he talks about using stats to not supplant grounded understanding, but expand it. And you know, to use stats to give us additional warrants to tell the stories that we want to tell about not just what people do. Quantitative methods are very good at what people do, but why are they doing it? And we can't answer the why questions often without bringing in qualitative insights. Okay. So I really recommend that. And in fact, an international community has now grown up around quantitative ethnography. And the first conference is in October this year. OK. So we've got our data. We have decided what we think it's going to mean. But we now need to close the feedback loop. Because we're not interested in simply analyzing this data as researchers. We want to give that back to the learners and the educators. So we've got to make it visible in some way. And this is where we get to those proxies, the social proxies analogous to the, the ones that Ericsson was creating for chat and lectures and so forth. Right? So we have a proxy to do with how were they talking. It's a good old social network sociogram type thing. We've got a proxy which is trying to feed back around the physical arousal. We've got a proxy around the movement because it turns out where you are when is terribly important. And we've got a proxy around the, the epistemic dimension of the ACAD framework. Who is doing what when? Okay. I'll go relatively quickly through these first three, but then focus on the timeline, the critical actions performed by nurses in a bit more detail because we've had more time to evaluate that. Okay. So firstly, um, we can generate a proxy uh, as to who is talking more and who is talking more to whom. Okay. So edge thickness is the intensity of the interactions, etc. So what does this allow us to do? Well, we can say, here's phase one before the critical incident, and we can compare how teams A, B, and C were interacting. You can see, obviously, that team A was having more interaction going on. Team B, mainly the leader and the patient, and the patient talking to RN2. Uh, team C looks even more impoverished. Okay. Right. Patient loses consciousness, and then everything changes. Okay. They have roles. There is a leader. Leader has to talk to RN2 a lot. And you can see that immediately happens. But team A maintained other interaction that teams B and C were not. RN4, completely out of the loop. What's going on there? Okay. So provocations to reflection and discussion. All right. There may be a very good reason why RN4 was observing. Maybe, you know, I mean, maybe something interesting was going on and it was justified. So the machine is not grading this yet. We're not at that stage. This is provocations to more productive reflection. Okay. That is the role that we see for the machine. Yeah? Just, uh, Edward, just, this is all taken from the, uh, the voice recording. This is taken from... Uh, I'll, I'll, this, is a, this is a mix of automated plus some human intervention. So this is not a completely automated infrastructure yet. And I'll, I'll tell you at the end which bits we can't yet do automatically. Okay. Um, and, well, I won't dwell on this, but there's, 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 there are extracts in the paper that sort of illustrate how the, col the quality of the communication in Team A, and this has been validated by the, you know, the instructors, was much better than what was going on in Team B, for example. Okay. The next one was around the movement and the position of the nurses. 
You know, so these are three video frames of them applying CPR in three different ways. Some of them are not correct. Okay, turns out this is the correct way. That's not correct. Uh, no, actually, that's incorrect. And there they are more over the patient. Okay, um, and again, so we're trying to give pick up location here, and so we again generated this visual proxy that showed, you know, where did they spend most of their time next to the patient or over the patient, and what were the nature of the transitions between those. Okay, so again, we can look for gross disparities between the teams. Hmm, that's interesting. What does that mean? Okay, and then after conscious loss of consciousness things get a little bit much more similar for all of the teams. Okay. And again, we can have some conversations there about what was going on there. Um, it turns out, you know, still team A spend more time next to the patient just as they did before. Uh, is that good? Is that bad? You know, should they actually be spending more time doing the bagging? That's standing at the top of the bed. Okay. Um, so again, we can compare between the phases and across the phases and between the teams, and we could we can sort of look at the video as well. So part of our fantasy is that you might jump back into the video to look exactly at the moment when they, they were doing a particular activity. Okay. Um, then the wristband data. So the this is a timeline and we're looking at EDA peaks in orange because we're showing physical intensity in blue, right? So what that means is if you are very, very active, like, you know, applying CPR, that will be blue, okay? Dark blue. And we would also expect you to be having EDA peaks in a dark blue session. So that's why they're gray. But what's interesting is where you're peaking, but you're not physically that active, okay? That suggests something's going on in your head in some way, about the way you're engaging with the problem. Okay. Now, it turns out that it's not a simple, straightforward case that you are highly stressed, necessarily, um, because when we go to the videos, we could tell that, you know, this person was, seemed from the videos and what they were saying to be both worried and engaged and nervous at different points. This person, no peaks at all, seemed to be supportive and relaxed, right? now. There's a conversation to have. Text of those previous diagrams, you can see why. There's a conversation to have as to whether that's appropriate or not, yeah. you know, or were they just, you know, almost disengaged in an inappropriate way. So again, when we, you know, this person was disengaged. This one was disengaged for some of the time, but other times seemed to be in a, an appropriate state, you know. Okay. So again, we wouldn't want the machine to judge this necessarily, but. Absence of any arousal at all might be a pause for reflection, you know, and you'll see in some of the quotes later from the, ac the academics, you know, what they would do if they saw that, because, of course, we're only interested in this if it leads to productive insights of certain sorts. All right. Okay. Um, okay. And then the final one, which I'll talk about, is this timeline. We called it the team timeline. And that was generated, you know, pretty much automatically, completely. Um, uh, and it, you can see you've got the four nurses, the four RNs, doing different things. You've got a critical incident here where the patient asks for help, another one where they lose consciousness, and you can see what they're doing, you know, including things like calling the doctor and attaching leads and uh, consulting documentation, stopping fluids. Okay. Now. The question is, is that useful? So we have had the chance to actually do studies now with students and the educators around this representation. And we've also been doing some more work on what we call applying data storytelling principles. So there's a paper that we presented at the Learning Analytics Conference where we are taking principles for data storytelling, which are really visual design principles for foregrounding and backgrounding information, <coughs> adding captions to highlight information, highlighting regions that are of particular interest, um, adding a meaningful sort of headline at the top which summarizes the overall story, okay? And 
allowing the, uh, the, the, the student or the educator to turn on and off different layers, like in Photoshop. Okay. So you can see in this case, they've got the time response layer on, and it's, it's giving them some feedback here. You took too long to start compressions. Okay. But that was OK. It's in blue. All right. OK, I'm going to give you a little video clip of that in action, just so you can see what it looked like. So let me just flick. So that was um, so that was um, an interactive uh, mock-up that we built. Um, we can't generate that for real yet, but we wanted to test the concept and the interaction style, and you know, before we start committing to code. Um, okay, what do the students think about this? So we have had the chance to generate the data for those students immediately after. You know, so it's, it's automated enough that we can do this immediately after the, the debrief, um, after the simulation. Um, even though it does, there is a human observer logging a few things on an iPad as they do things, things that we can't pick up automatically yet. So you know, they could make sense of the timeline. You can see they're constructing meaningful interpretations here. You know, while RNs 4 and 2 were doing the fluids, I was staying with the patient. It's good to step back and look at what each person was doing. One thing at the same time, I think it shows how you worked uh, as a team. Or it seems like a lot was done in clumps. You were talking to the patient, looking for information, while others were doing the observations. That seems practical to me. So you know, they, they can trace what was going on. And we've got many other quotes like this where they're saying, you know, did we do that? Uh, oh, yeah, we did. That's good. Okay. Staff, 
So we've had about eight professors and instructors looking at that timeline I just showed you the video of, and we've had some amazing feedback from them. They're really excited about this. Okay, um, here's the one talking about well, what if they had no arousal peaks? You know, you know, what are you actually? What's happening? Why are you? Why weren't you engaging with that? So you know, we need to let students understand that that's okay. Um, you know, if they got highly stressed, you know. They need to be able to normalize the fact that it's really normal to get super stressed when you're doing this kind of thing. Okay? But perhaps, you know, if, if we imagine that this tool had been used over a period, you might be able to look back at the replay of what you were like six months ago and now see how you had developed. You know, now you just, you just know how to do this, right? And, but when you look at yourself doing it six months ago, you know, that will show you how much progress you've made. So here's another one. You know, you know, here this, I'm assuming RN1's called the doctor and then told them to get the rhesus trolley, but there's no other delegation in here. There are no activities going on, right? The timeline's blank. There's nothing being done. It's all reactive. It's not proactive, okay? So the educator is reading meaning into that representation and is diagnosing that the team had a problem of some sort. I think it gives some students something to look at. You show them the location, like, for example, you're supposed to be interacting with a patient but you're standing at the end of the foot of the bed, you know, you can show them this and ask them why, okay? Unless we show them recordings, they won't remember what they actually did. Using TeamN, that was the name we gave this tool, some really would remember exactly how they would do it differently next time. It would be really helpful for students in terms of a reflection. If you gave them really structured reflection questions and this information and asked them to reflect on what they were doing, and whether it was accurate or not, how they were engaging with a patient and other team members, what they were thinking and feeling at a time, it could be a really valuable tool for deep reflection. So, as you can imagine, we were like really pleased to hear them saying things like this, because this is what we had been designing for. And this is what they had said to us way, way back months ago when we were doing storyboarding and wireframing before we could actually do this for real. So that was pretty exciting. And, you know, from a pedagogical perspective, you know, they started talking about, you know, the kinds of questions they might want to ask about performance or arousal or mistakes, uh, about response times, about positioning, about unsafe practices, you know. Some things are better and some are worse. Some things are just plain wrong and will kill the patient. Um, they talked also about the idea of creating perhaps fictional replays so let's create a timeline for an appalling team and get the students to diagnose what was wrong. Let's create a timeline for an elite team and show them what that looks like. Okay. So it could just be fake data for instructional purposes. All right. OK, this is what we can do automatically, and this is what still needs manual interventions. Okay. For the different proxies, you can see for doing the speech one, we still have to log who was talking when. Now, in theory, we shouldn't have to do that. They were wearing clip mics, but it was just too much noise going on and the mics weren't good enough. So maybe if we upgrade our hardware, we will be able to sp tell speech onset offset automatically, but right now we actually had to have somebody logging it. The wristband... Also the other problem we've got hmm? there is knowing who was talking to who. You yes. Know, someone's talking at a particular yeah. time, but are they directing their speech to... So there are people trying to work on figuring out who's talking to who. For example, you know, they can wear a belt and orientation is tracked. But you know, if I look at you and talk to you, then I'm not actually doing that. Yeah. It's pretty tricky. So we still needed a human observation. But I actually wonder whether that could be a role for a student who's been told, here are the things you're meant to be looking for. Yes. I imagine that yes. your iPad yes. interface had a, a template to just yeah. tap when you saw things. That's right. And it could be for instructively very valuable for one person to be, for a student yeah. to be. It could be pedagogically useful to actually get students to be observers. Yeah rather than having expensive researchers, because obviously that doesn't scale. You know? So we are thinking all the time, how does this scale? How could this actually become business as usual? Uh, because you know, we can't have a dedicated research team doing this all the time. OK. Um, and you can see a couple of other things just weren't working. We had to actually manually download the wristband data. And the nursing actions, because we were using lower fidelity uh, dummies, mannequins, not all the nursing actions could be automatically logged yet. OK. All right. So. Just to step back, you know, where have we got to? Um, we've, we've got a methodology, 
I think that's as, as interesting as actually having done something for a particular problem, although we're really proud of that. You know, the methodology is to go from a 21st century competency or a transferable skill or whatever language you want to use, a graduate attribute of teamwork, which is very hard to assess. It's ephemeral and it's opaque to computational analysis. And we've now moved to a situation where it's persistent rather than ephemeral. We can automatically or semi-automatically fuse the data and model it to add meaning. We can make that visual so that we can feed it back. And we've got quite a lot of encouraging evidence from the students and the instructors that this is making sense to them. Okay. And in particular, you know, behind that yellow arrow, there's a methodology here. This is a discipline uh, of modeling quantitative data from qualitative insights into how to talk about it in a meaningful way. Um, going forward, well, there's many, many possible ways forward. Technically, obviously, we'd like to make this more and more robust, more and more affordable. You know, the price of sensors, et cetera, is coming down um, and automate the whole process. But, you know, as we've said, maybe there's actually value in having students studying the activity and logging who's doing what. Um, how could we configure um, other learning spaces to do this? It takes us about an hour to set up around a ward to track this data around a bed. You know, um, we really want it to just turn, press a button and it always works, you know, but that's, that's the, the engineering side of things. Empirical studies, you know, we want to now, you know, do more testing with the health faculty, but expand it to other disciplines who are interested in high performance teamwork. That's everywhere. Um, I haven't talked a lot about privacy and ethics, but that has been a, an active discussion with the students and the staff about what data they feel is good to, con is good to capture who should see the data. We have some differences between the academics who are very interested in the stress data, but the students are less interested in that. Uh, there's some anxieties about who should see the data or not. You know, should, a different, should you be able to see another team's data, all the data, some of the data, um, et cetera. So that's, that's, a, that's a live discussion. Um, and then, of course, you know, this is all about learning in the end. So, you know, um, the fact that it's now digital, replayable, you know, every student could get an email to replay their, their simulation at their leisure afterwards uh, with some structured reflection activities around that. Um, and as I said, um, there's the idea of creating fictional replays, fictional dashboards, which are, you know, there to help students practice their diagnostic skills and whether they can see what was wrong, you know. Because literally, a timeline or a proxy literally makes it visible as to what we mean by good communication, good coordination. We can now, you can actually see what it looks like when it's done well and done badly. And that makes something tangible that until now has been quite intangible. Okay, so I'll stop there. Happy to chat. <laughs>